as a rule, year in, year out, I think they're kind of a silent stealer, whatever you want to call it. Probably rob a little bit each year, and I think you could probably go out in just about any wheat field if you looked hard enough and you could find some evidence of one or more of the species of root and crown rot. Um, I have seen a, a few cases where it's been a really major problem. And certainly that's what you want to avoid. And if you're interested in, you know, kind of maximizing and, you know, shooting for those higher yields, it just makes sense to use some of the management strategies to minimize as much as you can. But I uh, came to Lyman County in 1988 as a county extension agent at that time. Changed to educator and now we're field specialists or those of us that survived the reorganization. But over that time, of course, I've learned a lot from Emmanuel and, and his predecessors as to, you know, how to identify different diseases and, and what it takes to manage and try to prevent them. And of course, I've, I've seen a lot of root rot, had a lot of producers ask me what's wrong with my field, how come I have these white patches out there? And I certainly have gotten to the point where the very first thing I do if I see, you know, get asked about white patches and wheat is I go out and pull them up and look at the roots and the crowns. And just for identification purposes, the subcrown inner node, of course, is this section of the plant between the crown and this is where the seed would have been if, if, if it was still attached. So that section is actually some stem tissue. That's called the subcrown inner node. If that's discolored, that's a very common description or symptom of common root rot. If you have the area above the crown, and we couldn't really find any in the looking we did, but if that area right there looks like you took a black or brown, dark brown shoe polish applicator and, and colored that, and it does not rub off, that's pretty indi good indication of the root rot disease called take all. And uh, what you need to do, of course, is peel back that outer sheath and get down to that true stem tissue in order to look at that. Then if you have uh, another root rot disease where maybe it's kind of a grayish color, maybe some pink streaks kind of extending up the stem tissue a little bit, and sometimes you can even split that stem and see some of that pinkish streaks up inside there. That's a pretty good indication or symptom of another disease called fusarium root rot. And Emmanuel was trying to address that it fusarium attacks other parts of the plant than just the head. So, you know, that would not same organism, but it would not cause scab and not be directly related to scab at all. But it's, it can be, they can all be pretty devastating or yield restricting. And then we have two other, at least two other that I'm aware of, root and crown rot diseases. Uh, one of those is called Rhizoctonia root rot. And uh, I know Dwayne Beck, he refers to that as kind of a wimp. Maybe not survive all that well. Um, maybe certain environments it does. I think he said he's had people from the Pacific Northwest, like the Palouse wheat producing region. They might come here and watch him plant wheat after wheat and they ask, how in the world do you get by with that? Because apparently it's much more predominant there than it is here, because they really deal with rhizoctonia a lot, I think. And the other one that I'm aware of would be one called Pythium. And I don't think that's overly common either. Um, I remember one case a producer had sprayed out a CRP field and no-till wheat into that and it was happened to be some pretty low ground and, and pretty wet and those plants came up and just wilted over and they were just mush. And Connie Tandy was here and I think Connie Strunk there suggested too that that may possibly very well have been Pythium. I, I wish I'd have collected some samples and sent them to the diagnostic lab, but those two I don't think are near as common as the common, the t take all and the fusarium are the two big ones that, that we really kind of deal with and see a lot. But when you see those kind of things, of course they affect the roots, they, they cause the 
restrict the plant's ability to take up moisture and nutrients, and you know that's not a good thing. And the weather turns warm, temperatures warm up, maybe soil dries out a little bit, that, that thing's just losing ground. It just can't keep up. And there were some of the plants here, maybe some suspicion as to what some of the bleaching might have been, might kind of relate back to some horticulture things. If you see a tree where the edges of the leaves are starting to get scorched, that's a pretty good indication. That's the last part of that plant to receive the moisture and nutrients. It's got to go through the entire plant in order to get there, and that's the first part of the plant to show signs of that shortage. And maybe that's what's going on here, I don't know, but it probably won't take very long and the entire plant will show it. And so you'll get premature ripening, probably often before the heads, the kernels are filled, and you're gonna end up with light wheat and maybe shriveled kernels, and yeah, it can be a pretty big yield loss. To try to, to, try to outline the more extreme cases of that, I can think of a couple of cases, uh, I think both occurred last year. Um, I take that back, one was the year before and one was last year, but they both involved CRP fields that were taken out and put into production. And this one case, the guy come and asked me, boy, would you come look at this weed? It doesn't look right, you know, there's these white patches in it. And I pulled up plants, of course, and sure enough, there was, you know, one or more of those root rot diseases in there. And then he said, boy, it's kind of odd, you know, here this strip here that I, you know, planted food plots every year that this is in CRP, doesn't look near as bad. And sure enough, you know, you go over there and, and there weren't near the situation there was in the main part of the field. And well, they'd been planting food plots in there. It hadn't been grass for 10 years or 20 years or whatever it was. When he told me, then his custom combiner, he had yield monitors on his combine, he said the majority of that field was running about 45 bushels. They got in those food plots and they were pushing 80. So there's a, an extreme case on a big scale. He got robbed really bad. There was another case, the um, guy took a CRP field out again, sprayed it out this time, did not do tillage. He planted sunflowers in it in the spring. Got a terrible stamp, just horrible. Plant here, plant there, plant there. Sprayed that out when it was about two feet tall. And uh, planted it to winter wheat that fall. And that was the fall of, uh, I think it was fall of 2010. And so that's the year we got a pretty major rain event, about the 9th of September. And any wheat planted before that date, the following spring, showed a lot of barley eldorf, awful lot. Wheat planted after that was progressively less. So he, this producer called me out to that field and I said, boy, yeah, you got barley eldorf, no question. Well, when he went to harvest that, here he takes his combine up on this high corner of this field. It was up kind of on the way up a hill he looks down over this field and he said, oh man, he knew exactly what went on. He had five blocks, square blocks in that field that wheat was beautiful. And the rest of it was ragged up and down, terrible looking wheat. And he said the majority of that field made about 40 or so, or I think he said the field averaged 40 in those blocks, he didn't have a yield monitor, but he said he knew he was hitting 60 plus bushel wheat. And so what I did was I went out and took, pulled up plants and actually sent them to Brookings. And I, I understand there's a poster being made from, from this deal, but there was a dramatic difference in the root mass and indications of root rot it was way less, or if not at all, in those food, where those food plots were compared to the rest of the field. And the root rot hit them far, far worse than the barley yellow did, without question. So that brings us down to how do you manage this? Well, I, I'd say we, we would probably say the number one way to manage it is crop rotation. I know, like Duane, he talks often on, as you tour the farm here about, you know, the old days when you had your base. 
Well, in the old wheat fallow days, half your farm was wheat. Well, a lot of guys now maybe like to still raise a fair amount of wheat, and that's a good thing in this country. And so if you're gonna do that, it might be a good thing if you raise two wheats in a row and then break it up with two other crops. And hopefully you got a broadleaf crop in there, one or more. Well, crop rotation is a great thing. And if you can include a broadleaf crop, that's, that's very good. Um, second way, I don't know if these are in any exact particular order, but seed treatment can have some effect. And if you look in that, I think you're gonna get or you already got a copy of that crop protection guide for wheat, corn and soybeans probably. If you look in there, the seed treatment guide, they'll have all the seed treatment products and then they'll have a variety of diseases that they're labeled or somewhat effective against. You can find products that have pretty good efficacy on common root rot, on fusarium root rot, and on rhizoctonia. I don't think there's pythium in there, which shouldn't be a huge concern, but also you won't find anything that's really effective on take all. It's just not gonna be there. So you're gonna rely on crop rotation pretty heavily. And then there is some difference at times, at least somewhat between varieties. One variety that really stands out and comes to mind is Alliance. Now that kind of fell by the wayside several years ago, but that was shown to be quite resistant to root rots. One variety that didn't fall, didn't fare well was Nakoda. In between that and stem rust, being susceptible to that, you know, it's pretty much long gone. But there will be some difference in varieties and you might want to look and see if there are ratings for those. So far as I know, that's pretty well how you, how you manage root and crown rot diseases. I want to mention one other thing, and then I'll try to remember to kind of touch on that chloride issue. I just kind of put together a little display, kind of, kind of a unique opportunity here. Last summer I had a producer call me up and say, boy, I need some information on common bunt. This is kind of a problem that doesn't really hit a lot of people, but boy, when it hits somebody, it can be kind of ugly. This guy took some seed wheat out of the same bin kind of split it with his cousin. His cousin treated his, he did not. So here's one case of what happened, it's pretty interesting. He had this field here in the uh, fall of 2011. He started planting the outside of this field of corn. He just went, started around and around, he got rained out. By the time he could get back in there, he decided, boy, it's too late. So we took prevent plan on it. I don't know how he worked that out with his insurance company, but it's what he said he did. So we basically chem fallowed the center part of this field. So middle of September, he went out there and planted winter wheat. Well, he didn't plant the outside until about the middle of October after he harvested the corn. So it turns out right to the line, he tells me. He had common bunt where he planted corn, planted later, didn't really have any to speak of where a chemical fallow died. So there's something to do with get the passing tractor here. There's kind of something to do with timing of planting and the conditions and how well that crop, how quickly and vigorously it can emerge but that's probably not something you want to gamble with, with producers. But seed treatment is obviously the answer, the biggest answer, plant clean seed and, and treat. If you do that, you virtually won't have common bunt. But that was kind of an interesting case. But I happened to go out there with him. He, of course, steered a little wide in a couple spots and worked out pretty good. The, plants on the right here have common bunt in them and you can look in there and see the darkened kernels in the head. Plants on the left are healthy and they might have been right next to each other. And I kind of grouped them with masking tape here. It's pretty interesting. Here there's three heads in one and two in two groups. Those all came from the same plant. So it's infected at seedling and it's a systemic. That's really interesting. Here's the bunted seed, healthy seed. 
here's some really bad stuff. And this is kind of a powder that another producer brought me a sample. It came on his combine window as he was harvesting. So it can be some pretty ugly stuff. Smells like rotten fish. And it's not uncommon to get rejected totally at the elevator. Or might be docked like a dollar a bushel. So that can be a big, big hit. So plant clean seed treat, probably not a problem. We're doing some research, some studies on chloride. And really, a kind of our intention is, it seems like we find too many producers and maybe people advising them, frankly, are just really pushing that fungicide issue maybe a little harder than they should be. And I know, certainly, if you plant wheat back into wheat residue and you've got weather, wet, wet weather forecast, Boy, throwing that fungicide in with a herbicide is, doesn't cost very much money, and that's the biggest reason why it's done. But it kind of alarms me how many people, how many producers are, put, are doing that when they're not planting into wheat residue. Because it really doesn't make all that much sense. What you're protecting against mainly is tan spot and septoria, and those are wheat residue-borne diseases, period. Not on oats, not on corn, not on milo, not on soybeans, field peas. None of those crops host those diseases. Probably the only other disease you might be looking at at that stage is powdery mildew. And that's not all that common. And so we want to try to discourage fungicide use when you don't have a good reason to do it. Because you might get resistance. We're killing good fungi. Those good fungi can affect aphid. They can affect grasshoppers. They can affect feed on bacteria. There's a lot of good reasons to keep those around. There really is. And so part of what we're doing is we're trying to look at seeing if we can document the benefits of adequate chloride. So we're doing some studies where we're comparing no chloride to chloride, see if we can keep those levels up in the plant, keep that plant healthy because we know chloride inherently helps the plant stay healthier and stand off some disease. And we're taking tissue samples, seeing if we can keep the chloride content in the plant up. And that nutrient can last possibly several years because very little gets taken up in the grain. It's mostly in the plant itself. And we also believe it can not only affect foliar diseases, but possibly these root rots too. And so hopefully look for that, and I better quit and turn it over to Connie Strunk.